Excellent. Well, um, uh, welcome everyone for uh, uh, to the next session. Um, just uh, a bit of bookkeeping questions in the Slack channel, please. I will monitor those. And uh, there's $25 for the first student question too. Don't forget that. That could be life changing amount of money. Um, and so we'll we'll get started with the Bok Prize lecture. Uh, the first speaker is, of course, the winner of the Bok Prize. For those who don't know, Bart Bok was director of Mount Stromlo Observatory from 57 to 66, and uh, he founded the uh, Graduate School of Astronomy at ANU. And uh, it was not only a prolific researcher, but also dedicated to promoting astronomy and astronomy education. I was told that he used to recommend staff spend at least one night a month lying on their back outside admiring the sky to remind them why they got into astronomy in the first place. I don't know whether he enforced that, but uh, he strongly certainly recommended it. So the Bok Prize is awarded annually in, to recognise outstanding research in astronomy by uh, an honours or master's student at an Australian university. And as Kath said earlier, for all of our prizes, the competition has been absolutely incredible. And it just says something about how, how, how great the astronomy is that's being done by this community. I mean, we should all be very, very proud. The winner for this year, Madeline McKenzie from UWA. And uh, I believe Lisa is going to hand over the, uh, the medal. Thank you, John. So I'm, I'm going to read out the citation because I found it amusing and I, not in a bad way, in a good way. Um, Madeline's project was based on simulations, which can be a difficult project to complete as not always simulations can render useful results. The fact that the project was at the intersection of observations and theory was considered as one of the factors contributing to the difficulty of the project and making the successful outcome of this project even more impressive. So Maddie did a, a fantastic job of an extremely difficult project. And um, this is one of the main reasons why she received this award. I'm also delighted that um, Maddie's here now at the ANU and that I'm able to give her this beautiful bronze uh, Bok Prize. And, and I should say, I, I was a Bok Prize winner um, in 1996, which Maddie tells me is a year before she was born. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. Thank you. Thank you. So Maddie, I'll give you a, a five minute warning. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me for this afternoon session. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to the ASA for being given this opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all students when I say that 2020 was a tough year to be doing research. Um, so I consider myself incredibly lucky to be standing here talking to you today. As you can see, my project was on simulations of globular clusters, and I did that under the supervision of Professor Kenji Becky. Before I go any further though, I would like to pause and acknowledge the First Nations people of Australia. I was born and raised on Wajak Noongar Buja, and that's where I completed my masters. Today, I'm speaking to you from Nambri and Ngunnawal country as I've moved to Mount Stromlo to start my PhD. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of both these regions. I'd like to start with telling you my three main messages for my talk. Um, I would like to say so much more, but I've only got uh, 15 minutes, so it's just three. Um, globular clusters uh, have multiple stellar populations. How these populations formed is an unsolved mystery in astrophysics. However, the AGB plus accretion scenario shows promise. And finally, very gas-rich dwarf galaxies are required for globular cluster formation. Now, you might think that globular clusters are just some giant balls of star that float around the galaxy, but because they are so old, they represent the fossil record of the early universe. And this allows us to use them as low metallicity nucleosynthetic laboratories. Recently, with the advent of Gaia, they're being used to reconstruct the assembly history of the Milky Way, but they're not just found around the Milky Way, they're found around almost all galaxies that we can see. And by looking at the dynamics and metallicities of the clusters, um, this can be used to constrain dark matter masses and the formation processes of the galaxy. Globular clusters can contain X-rays, gamma rays, millisecond pulsars, X-ray binaries, 
or maybe even the ever-elusive intermediate mass black hole. This makes them a great target for future gravitational uh, wave detections. Um, they've been used to refine and calibrate stellar libraries and population models, and they have even been used to validate the age of the universe. But we don't know how they form. And you might say, well, Maddie, we do know how they form. It's just a giant ball of gas which collapses to form a giant ball of stars. And I totally forgive you for thinking this way, um, because if you take a color magnitude diagram with B and V filters uh, and draw a line through all the phases of stellar evolution, uh, you get an isochrone, a curve representing a population of stars with the same age. And from this, you can kind of get the gist that this could be a single cell population. Um, but this plot here was taken from a paper published 10 years before I was born. So we're just gonna jump forward a couple of decades. Um, I'm gonna be showing some work from Malone et al. Uh, on the left is a two color magnitude diagram, but we're now using Hubble filters instead of the B and V filters from before. So on the Y axis, I have one Hubble filter, but on the X, I have a combination of filters nicknamed the magic trio for its ability to separate out different populations of stars. So now we can draw another isochrone here, but if you kind of squint a little, you can also draw another one. For the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna be calling this the first generation or 1G, and this one, the second generation or 2G. And we can take this a step further, right? We can create a pseudo two color magnitude diagram, otherwise known as a chromosome map. This uses the magic trio of filters on the Y axis, but also another combination of filters on the X. The dominant pink second generation isochrone is now in this region and the first generation is below it. Changing the internal abundances of elements such as nitrogen, magnesium and oxygen will all change where a star sits on the chromosome map and by extension what pet population it belongs to. So now we can go and create a bunch of these chromosome maps for all galactic globular clusters. So each one I'm showing here uses that magic trio of filters on the Y axis and then another combination of filters on the X. The little circle in the bottom left hand corner shows the photometric errors and the arrow is the uh, reddening vector. There's a dashed line dividing the first generation population and the second generation. In the bottom panel, I'm highlighting type one globular clusters. And these are clusters with two populations of stars or bimodal population. Um, this makes up 83% of all galactic globular clusters, but there is always going to be some exceptions to the rule, and these are our type 2 globular clusters. Now, these have a huge spread on the chromosome map, and the blue points are just particular stars they used in this study. Um, if you're a huge, ner huge nerd like I am and have memorized the NGC numbers to your favorite globular clusters, <laughs> you might not be surprised that NGC 5139 is Omega Centauri. And this is one of the pieces of evidence that we have that these might not actually be globular clusters. They could be the nucleuses of galaxies that were destroyed and ripped apart by our Milky Way. The main message here is that globular clusters are not single stellar populations. So there are heaps of different observational constraints that we have on these multiple stellar populations. So I'm only gonna talk about the top three today, but if you wanna know more, you can always ask during questions. Um, so, multiple stellar populations exist in almost all globular clusters, and this has actually been suggested to be the criteria for being a globular cluster, having a bimodal population of stars. The second generation can be up to 90% the mass of the cluster, and the second generation stars are enhanced in helium, nitrogen, and sodium, and depleted in carbon and oxygen with respect to the first generation. For this prop talk, I'm going to be using 47 Takane as a reference cluster. If anyone knows me, uh, 47 Takane is my favorite globular cluster. Uh, it's got a mass of 7 times 10 to the 5 solar masses. 30% uh, of that is the first generation, and 70% of that is the second. All right, so the next question you would ask is, well, how do these populations form? And again, I don't have much time to go into detail about this, but there's a great review by Bastian and Lardo, um, which you can read if you're interested or you can again ask me some questions at the end. Um, but the scenario I'm going to talk about today is the asymptotic giant branch scenario or AGB. And in this scenario we start with a first generation that's collapsed from some giant molecular cloud. 
AGB stars, which are stars kind of nearing the end of their lifetime, start to shed their outer layers. And these outer layers are enriched in those particular elements that go in to form the second generation. Now, if we just assume, say, a 1% star formation efficiency, then we would have to create 700% of the mass of the second generation in order to form what we see for 47 Tuck. This is called the mass budget problem. Um, how can the first generation create such a massive second generation? Well, there are a couple solutions to it, but this is the one I'm gonna to discuss today. The AGB plus gas accretion scenario. So again, we start with a first generation. AGB stars shed their outer layers, but this time the, uh, the parent galaxy is donating some of its gas to the cluster in order to form our second generation. So the question I had is, can we test whether this is possible using hydrodynamical simulations of a globular cluster in its host galaxy? So to do this, I need to use some simulation code. And for this uh, study, I'm using original code written by Kenji, which is described in his 2013 and 2015 papers. The code is based on smooth particle hydrodynamics, and I ran it on the Hyades clusters at ICRA and also the OzStar GPUs at Swinburne. Um, to do this, I need to split it up into two separate simulations. In both cases, I'm using an NFW dark matter density profile and an exponential disk. In the first set of simulations, I evolve a dwarf galaxy with 350 mega years to investigate giant molecular cloud formation and therefore first generation formation. Next, I use a different code which has different gravitational softening lengths for each component, which allows me to better model the accretion of gas onto the globular cluster. All right, so I'm gonna show you an animation of the first generation. So pretty early on, you can see that this cluster is, uh, it's very gas rich. So the gas is condensed, gas is on the left, stars are on the right. Um, you can see that some supernova going off, so there's little supernova bubbles. And for each of those giant molecular clouds that have just formed, um, they've each got an associated star cluster. All right, power through. So what I'm showing here is a collection of models, all with the same dark matter mass, but different stellar and gas fractions. So globular clusters are old. Therefore, we're going to assume they're forming in some kind of high redshift galaxy. They're also metal poor, and by the mass metallicity relationship, you've got to assume it's going to be some kind of dwarf. And what I find is that only dwarf galaxies with high gas content are capable of forming these giant molecular clouds and therefore the globular cluster progenitors. So these are all the models that are on the top row here. Uh, and what I've been told is that observationally, you tend to see clumpy high redshift galaxies. So, so maybe with future telescopes, we might be able to look back into high redshift galaxies in detail and see baby globular clusters forming. I'm gonna jump now to the formation of the second generation. Again, gases on the left, stars are on the right, but now I'm gonna use a white circle to show where the first generation is during this simulation. So, so pretty early on, you can see it's accreted some gas from the galaxy, that's the high density region inside the white circle. And it's also forming some new stars, which are gonna be our second generation. You can also see on the stars panel that there are lots of other small star clusters that are interacting with each other. Unfortunately, we don't have the resolution to model all of them. Uh, only the things that are inside that white circle have that really high um, resolution, but hopefully, future simulations will be able to model the entire galaxy with the same resolution and see cluster formation happening uh, across the whole galaxy, which I think would be really cool. Five minutes. So, thank you. Um, so now I can track the mass of all the different components surrounding the first generation as a function of time. The aqua line shows we're starting with a globular cluster progenitor, the first generation uh, that's got a mass of 10 to the six solar masses and there's 10 to the five solar masses of disk stars surrounding that cluster. After about 10 mega years, ISM or interstellar medium is introduced into the system as signified by the dark blue line and as, uh, AGB gas is starting to be released from that first generation. And then together, 
they're forming the second generation. And when you look at the ratios that we come out with after 350 mega years, we get this perfect number of 30% first generation, 70% second generation, just like 47 tuck. And now I repeated this process uh, for a bunch of different models testing different galactic initial conditions and different parameter combinations. And what I am showing here is the culmination of all those simulation sets. On the x-axis, I'm showing the total cluster mass. So this is uh, the first generation plus the second generation. And the y-axis is the fraction of first generation stars. So a fraction of one means you've got entirely first generation, whereas a lower number means you've got a higher contribution from your second generation. Um, these white points are my AGB plus accretion models. And this blue star is the model that I just showed you previously. I've just fit a line of best fit to these points, uh, which is in pink. The AGB only models are those orange squares, and those represent models which did not experience any accretion from the galaxy. So this is the pure AGB scenario. And you can see that they're very 1G dominated. Um, so this is exactly what we are talking about with the mass budget problem. So now if we compare this to observations, what I'm showing here is a plot from the recent Graton et al review, which uses the same axis as I am, but is showing the predicted initial masses of galactic globular clusters as calculated by Baumgard et al 2019. If I then fit a line of best fit to their circle points, which represent their galactic GCs, and place it onto my plot, we can see that I'm in pretty good agreement with what the observed um, characteristics of galactic globular, globular, geez, globular clusters are. So I say that we can reproduce the observed scaling relationship for second generation masses. Now, to my knowledge, no one has run uh, globular cluster simulations on a galactic scale before, and let alone this number of models exploring this many parameter sets. Um, so to get this close to observations, which didn't even exist uh, by the time when I st first started my masters, um, it's a really incredible result that I'm really, really happy about. So now I return to my main messages. Um, I hope I've convinced you all that globular clusters do in fact contain multiple stellar populations. I've shown that with the AGB plus accretion scenario, we can reproduce observations of observed galactic globular clusters. And finally to do this, it requires a very gas rich high redshift dwarf galaxy, both for the formation of giant molecular cloud forming first generation and also to supply gas to the, to the first generation to form the second generation. Um, that's all from me today. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, thanks very much, Maddie. There's a, a number of questions. I'm not sure we'll get through them all, but let's have a go. Patrick Armstrong, uh, is there a statistical method for squinting and differentiating between the two generations? Um, I believe population, there's like different, it's usually done in the chromosome map um, where you can just do population models of the two areas. But I think, yeah, it's a, just kind of fitting is a good way to go. I'm, a, I'm the uh, simulation side, so <laughs> I don't generally have to deal with them. Right, uh, Joan Gannon asks, do type two globular clusters tend to be brighter than type one? I would expect galactic nuclei to be slightly brighter than your average GC. Well, Omega Centauri is brighter um, and, you know, like M54 is part of the Sagittarius and also Gary DaCosta just gave me a thumbs up. So I'm going to say yes. <laughs> uh, Alessandro Paduano, can the second generation of stars be both old enough and massive enough to produce a population of black holes? Um, yes. So the discreteness of the two populations is one of these observational constraints that we have on globular clusters. Why does it stop after two? Why doesn't it keep going? Um, so I'm assuming the second generation could, um, but this is kind of one of the unsolved mysteries of how globular clusters form. I think that answers uh, Adam Batten's question too. Uh, they wanted to know why there were two generations, why not three or four? And indeed, in some of them, there are more than more than two. There's yeah. typically two very strong, but there's sometimes others as well. Uh, Kat Ross says, in your simulation of the second population forming, it seems like the stars appearing in the white circle have drifted from outside the circle into it, rather than spontaneously forming due to the gas accreting 
and first generation of stars expelling mass. Is that what we would expect? This is down to a resolution problem. And I discussed this in the paper. Um, there is some a light accretion of second generation stars, which do form outside the cluster, which does pose a problem for the chemistry of the scenario. Um, but I think there is resolution limits that we are hitting here. Uh, and so I think this will need to be repeated again with higher resolution uh, like simulations. Um, so not only having really high resolution uh, first generations, um, we need to up the resolution on the gas and the second generation in order to see whether this is an actual effect or if it's just kind of an artifact, but it's very keen eye picking that one up. Uh, perhaps the last question, uh, I'm going to uh, pick one, Shelmali Caps. Is the AGB plus accretion theory valid only for old globular clusters? Will it be valid for the multiple, personal multiple personalities? Multiple populations found in young or intermediate clusters as well? We think that this can occur in like say like the Magellanic cloud clusters have been shown to be quite young in age, but there have been clusters that have been identified with uh, multiple stellar populations. So we don't see any reason why this couldn't happen in younger globular clusters. As long as there's that gas rich environment, it should be able to accrete. Um, but I think the AGB scenario will still hold in those situations. Okay, well, in view of the time, I think we'll, we'll stop there. Thanks very much, Maddie. That was an excellent presentation. Have a look in, uh, in the Slack. There's a lot of uh, more questions for you and, and many congratulations as well. So well done. Okay, and thank you have very much. And is Danny there to uh, yeah. take over? Uh, very good. Um, so before I start, that was a great presentation, Maddie. Uh, well done. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, so Danny's from uh, Liverpool John Moores University, but visiting the University of Queensland. And he's going to tell us about uh, some Apogee results and how to find galaxies within galaxies. So I'll give you a three minute warning, which should then leave three minutes for questions. Sound okay? Yeah, thank you. Right, yeah. thanks. Yeah, so thank you for that great introduction. Uh, and thank you everybody for attending today. Um, it's a great privilege to be able to present some results uh, on the galaxy within the galaxy at my first ever ASA meeting. And uh, so this is very exciting. So yeah, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some results from a paper that I led in conjunction with all these amazing co-authors listed at the bottom of this slide, titled Evidence from Apogee for the Presence of a Major Building Block of the Halo Buried in the Inner Galaxy. So we know that in our current cosmological paradigm, Lambda CDM, galaxies grow in great measure by the process of hierarchical mass assembly. And in this formation mechanism, low mass galaxies get engulfed by larger mass galaxies. And as a result, these systems overall grow in size. Now this formation mechanism has been shown to be true, at least for the Milky Way, by the direct observational evidence of either ongoing accretion, like the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal, or the detection of phase space substructure in the stellar halo of the Milky Way, like the recently discovered gain of the sausage, the Helmish stream, Sequoia, Thamnos, and a further few substructures identified using the H3 survey. Moreover, there's also been predicted accretion events based on information from galactic global clusters, such as that of the koala or the kraken. However, all the discovered substructures in the stellar halo of the galaxy that are conjectured to be the debris of these cannibalized systems have been done so in regions of the stellar halo away from the galactic center, but of utmost importance to the innermost regions. And this is because of three main reasons. So the first one is because it's been shown using a single power law of the world describes the density of the stellar halo that approximately half of its mass is contained within a region of four to the parsec from the galactic center. So therefore, for a relatively small volume, it contains most of its mass. The second reason is because this is a spatial region, we'd expect to find the remnants of early and massive accretion events, which have been driven there by the ample friction. And the third reason is because this is also the spatial region, we'd expect to find the oldest in situ populations to reside in. But despite this region of the galaxy being so interesting to study, it's been very difficult to do so due to the high extinction, and specifically for the halo populations or the more metal poor populations, because they're vastly outnumbered by the intervening disk and metal rich populations in this region. However, we now live in the era of large stellar surveys, which are providing us with a wealth of information for thousands of stars in the Milky Way and are helping us rediscover uh, the mass assembly of the galaxy. And of these, there are loads. So in Australia, we have Galar, for example, and we also have Lamos and, and Rave. But two pioneering surveys that are helping us to do so are the Apogee Survey and, and Gaia. So for our work, what we set out to do is to combine the latest data releases at that time, so Apogee DR16 and Gaia DR2, in order to obtain a data set for which for the first time, 
we obtain detailed chemistry for up to 6,000 stars located within this inner region or within four kiloparsecs from the galactic center. And I use these two terms interchangeably. And in doing so, we obtain a very powerful data set for which we have exquisite chemical compositions, precise distances, and derived kinematics, which serve as a very powerful tool for performing galactic archaeology. So what we set out to do in this work is to use this data set in order to identify accretive populations and specifically place an emphasis on studying stellar populations in this inner region. So in order to identify accretive populations, what we use is we use a chemical uh, plane which has been used in previous studies, such as in Hawkes et al. 2015 or Dust et al. 2020, in order to dissect accretive from in situ populations. And this chemical plane is shown here in this illustration, where on the y-axis you have the ratio of magnesium to manganese abundances for every star as a function of aluminium over iron. Now, plotted as a 2D histogram in this plane, you have the parent sample we used, and then over plotted as red points are the stars from our parent sample located within this inner region. Now, as you can see from our parent sample, uh, it congregates in three main loci, or three main blobs here. One comprised by low aluminium and high magnesium values, marked by this solid black line is the accretive region, or what we define as the unevolved region, and a further two in the in-situ region, one at high alpha and one at low alpha, separated by this dashed line. Now, these two blobs in the in-situ region correspond to the high alpha and low alpha sequences we observe in the Tinsley diagram for the Milky Way. However, this accretive region, or as we refer to as the unevolved region, is a region we would expect to find to be dominated by accretive populations. And this is because any galaxy version onto the Milky Way would have had a star formation quench and therefore appear more unevolved chemically compared to its in-situ counterparts. And as you can see already, there are some stellar populations in the inner galaxy which occupy this region. So what we start to do then is to use this chemical dissection in order to map it in intervals of motion. And to do so, we use the most utilized intervals of motion planes, the energy angular momentum plane. So here on the y-axis, you have the orbital energy of every star, and on the x-axis, you have the angular momentum with respect to the galactic disk. Where here, I illustrate different arrows um, to give you an, an idea of what different families of orbits, uh, where they occupy a locus in this plane. So in the top panel, we only show those chemically defined in-city populations more metal poor than minus 0.8 in metallicity in order to make it more fair comparison when comparing it to the already metal poor accretive populations shown in the bottom panel. Now, what we need to take away from this result is that chemically defined in-city populations do not follow the same distribution in intervals of motion as its accretive counterparts. And by this, I mean that in-city populations show a much smoother distribution compared to the clumpy-like nature displayed by the accretive populations. And more specifically, if we look at the accretive populations in more detail, we find that there are two clear over densities here, one at high energy and one at lower energy, for roughly zero angular momentum, which seem to be separated by this energy gap, which is not really manifested in the in-city populations. And when studying these in more detail, we found that the one at high energy corresponds to the recently discovered guy inside a sausage accretion event, but the one at lower energy is this newly identified substructure, which we dubbed uh, Heracles, and we simply define by uh, a, a orbital eccentricity and an orbital energy cut, as well as the initial chemical dissection, of course. So once we stumbled across this substructure, which appears to be chemodynamically accreted, we go on to perform or to study it in more detail. And the first thing we do is we look at different chemical compositions provided by Apogee, which aim to give us an insight into the contribution from different nucleosynthetic channels, either contributed by massive stars, AGVs, type 1a or type 2 supernovae. So here you have the magnesium over iron, the aluminium over iron, the carbon plus nitrogen over iron, and the nickel over iron planes as a function of metallicity, where again, the parent samples display as a 2D histogram, the red points belong to Heracles, and the blue to the gain sausage. Now, you can see from these results that Heracles occupies a locus in this plane, which is typical of low mass satellite galaxies in the Milky Way, or accretive populations. And this is because it presents low aluminium by construction, but also low carbon plus nitrogen and low nickel when compared to the parent sample. Moreover, we also find that the chemi chemistry of Heracles in these chemical planes appears to be distinct to the guy inside the sausage. And this is because for fixed metallicity, it presents a higher mean magnesium, aluminium, and carbon plus nitrogen value. However, in order to test the reality of this substructure that we've identified um, using this data set, in our work, we've gone to perform some independent tests. So one of those tests involved looking at theoretical predictions. And in doing so, we looked at the Eagle numerical cosmological simulations and looked for Milky Way mass galaxies to see if any of these underwent an accretion event which resembled Heracles. And we found that roughly a third of our Milky Way mass galaxy sample, so 15 galaxies, underwent an accretion event of similar mass and similar redshift which resemble Heracles in different chemical composition planes. So three out of those 15 examples are shown here in the magnesium O'Brien, carbon O'Brien, and nitrogen O'Brien as a function of metallicity planes, where the red contours are marked the accreted populations and the black the in situ. 
And as you can see from these theoretical results, the chemistry of Heracles is consistent with the accretion hypothesis. Now, another test we perform is to take inner galaxy populations and model them using a Gaussian mixture modeling procedure in multiple 2D chemical composition planes to see if Heracles can be modeled as an independent component. And we do this in the initial magnesium over manganese as a function of aluminium over iron, and magnesium over iron and aluminium over iron as a function of metallicity planes. Where the raw data is here is displayed on the left column, in the middle you have the models, and on the right you have the residuals, where, which is the data minus the model. And anywhere where the residuals is zero means that the model models well the data. We don't set a fixed number of Gaussian components and we let this be free and we calculate the best number based on the Bayesian information criteria. And we find that the best number is either four or five components, where here we illustrate five. But more importantly, despite the four or five components, we find that in multiple 2D chemical composition planes, when looking at inner galaxy populations and modeling them using a Gaussian mixture modeling procedure, that Heracles appears as an, in, as an independent structure. So therefore, these, the results from these tests um, and reinforce the notion that Heracles is likely uh, an accreted substructure. However, recent results, um, specifically studying integrals of motion planes, have found that over densities in, for example, the energy angular momentum plane may be caused by underlying kinematic selection function effects uh, induced by the survey. Therefore, it is vital to combine the orbital properties with detailed chemistry or ages when possible in order to ascertain the reality of these substructures identified in these integrals of motion planes. Three uh, minutes. Thank you. In an upcoming study that I am leading, we are doing just that. So here's some preliminary results from, a, um, from work that I have in preparation, which should be submitted soon, in which you compare in a statistical way, using a chi-squared method, 13 different elements ranging different nucleus synthetic channels provided by Apogee uh, for a sample of Heracles with a high alpha disk or an in situ sample. And given the chi-squared value obtained from this and the probability value, we find that Heracles and the high alpha disk are statistically very different given the chemical compositions, therefore reinforcing the notion that the substructure we've identified um, is likely an accreted population. Furthermore, when looking at the properties of Heracles specifically in the alkaline plane, we find that Heracles occupies a locus which is modulo some in situ contamination which we assess for in our work, which is very interesting. And this is because it presents the thigh section of the renowned alkaline knee, but doesn't display the knee or the shin like the guy inside a sausage does. And in our work, we suggested this is likely because Heracles is the remnant of an accretion event that occurred early in the Milky Way's life and therefore had its star formation quenched early and didn't have time to develop the knee or the shin like the guy inside a sausage did. Furthermore, because it presents a high mean magnesium value at fixed metallicity when compared to the guy inside a sausage, we suggested in our work that it is also likely more massive in stellar mass. And this suggestion stems from theoretical work, uh, both that from a project I have ongoing, as well as from Macro 2019 and an in prep work by Emily Cunningham. So here's some preliminary results from a separate project that I have um, in which we look at the Milky Way-like halos from the lattice suite of fire to numerical cosmological simulations and identify accretion events in these Milky Way-like halos. And when looking at the mean magnesium and ion abundances and relating this to their stellar mass and their interval time or the time in which they get accreted, we find that those uh, accretion events which present a high mean magnesium value at fixed metallicity are typically more massive in stellar mass, accrete earlier, and as a result, a typically uh, morphologically phase mix. Furthermore, other results we have from this work, um, we, we are finding that early and massive accretion events typically posit the bulk of their stars at low orbital energies and therefore deepen the potential well of the host Milky Way like halo. And I think all these results are, are talking hand in hand with the observational findings we're finding for Heracles and are suggestive that Heracles is likely an accreted population uh, from, a, from a galaxy that accreted early in the Milky Way's life. So hopefully from this talk, I've convinced you that the intergalactic halo is an important region to study. Um, here I've provided evidence that, Heracles, that we've identified a substructure which we call Heracles, which we suggest constitutes the remnant of a major building block of the Milky Way halo and likely merged early in the Milky Way's life. Now given properties of this substructure, we suggest it comprises a third or fourth of all metal pole populations in the inner galaxy, which confirms predictions from different numerical simulation studies, either using the FIRE or the Auriga simulations but that it only accounts for approximately 5% of the total mass within this region. And we also find that the properties reveal a similarity to the predicted koala or kraken accretion event. Now, I've also shown that it is vital to combine the orbital information with detailed chemistry or ages when possible. And in an in-prep work, I've, um, I've shown you some preliminary results in which we find that Heracles is statistically different to the high alpha disk, given these chemical compositions. And I think all these results and results on the bulge, the disk and the halo of the Milky Way are suggesting the Milky Way may have had an atypical mass assembly history. 
So with that, I'll leave you and I'll take any questions. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Danny. Uh, haven't got any questions just yet. Uh, yes, here's one from Mark Dura. How close is Heracles to the plane? Can you see all of it? Great question. Uh, the answer is no, you can't see all of it. I'm sure there are many stars belonging to Heracles which we haven't found yet. Um, so what we found so far, this, this part of it at least, is contained within a, four, a spherical volume of four kiloparsecs from the galactic center. So um, it, it spans anywhere from above the plane up to four kiloparsecs. But uh, given the theoretical predictions, uh, I, I suggest that it is likely that it, there could be stars further out as well. Okay, um, one question from Sarah Martel. If Heracles is responsible for one third of the metapore stars in the bulge, how many other accreted systems make up the other two thirds? Great question. Um, well, I guess um, you have to take into account also the in situ populations that also would be the oldest in situ populations, which will likely be metal poor as well. But, um, the, again, the theoretical results we're finding from the Fire 2 simulations are suggesting that in the inner galaxy, there's, there is likely more, more substructures that have been accreted, and specifically more lower mass ones as well, which could even be more metal poor. So um, I think the world is our oyster in this regard. And, Everybody should be looking at the inner halo that's looking that's working in this field. Perhaps the galaxy is our oyster. Very big. Gal yeah, the galaxy is our oyster. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Uh, we'll thank Danny again. We'll move on to the next talk, please. Um, so uh, the next talk is the uh, Louise Webster Prize. And, uh, is our speaker here? Yes. Yep. Hi, uh, Joe. Um, so Louise Webster was a commissioning astronomer at the AAT and uh, one of the inaugural staff astronomers at the AAO before she joined UNSW. And uh, in addition to her research, she was very passionate about the importance of mentoring younger colleagues. So the society uh, awards the Louise Webster Prize uh, annually in recognition of uh, an outstanding piece of research by an early career scientist in their postdoctoral career. The prize is awarded on the basis of the impact of one paper. And this year, the winner is Joe Callingham, uh, formerly from University of Sydney, and now a Vini Fellow in Leiden. So uh, thank you, Joe. Congratulations. And I'll hand over to you to talk to us about uh, anisotropic winds in Wolf Rayet stars. Great, John. Can you oh. just confirm that's the right slide? You're seeing my title slide. That looks fine to me. Great. Uh, fantastic. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a five minute warning after 20 minutes. Okay, um, thank you, John. Um, uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, as, as John said, my name's uh, Joe Callingham. I'm based at Leiden University in Astron here in the Netherlands. And for those that don't know me, I did my PhD at the University of Sydney, uh, working and CSIRO working largely with Brian Gainsler, Ron Eakers, Elaine Sadler, and Randall Waith at, at, at UW, I mean, at, uh, in Perth. Um, so I'm going to give you a talk today about RPEP and introduce this concept of uh, dying massive stars. I hope, hope you're interested and hope, hope it's going to be fun. And as the talk goes, it might make more sense why I have a many coiled snake on my title slide. Um, to get underway, I really just want to get my thanks out of the way first. Well, firstly, I have to really thank the ASA and, and Louise Webster for this prize. Um, it was really an honor, an absolute delight to, to receive this prize. Um, and also, when I received it, I had a read about uh, Louise Webster's work and clearly she was an amazing astronomer who cared for the next generation of, of early career researchers. And I really enjoyed reading some of her, her best cited papers, particularly in high mass X-ray binaries. And hopefully, uh, because we're going to be talking about massive stars in this talk, um, she would have enjoyed this talk today as well. Now, obviously, getting this award, I, I, I have to say, the delight was also accompanied by a feeling of, I guess, apprehension. Um, because this was by no means a singular effort, right? This is, this is modern science. The way we do astronomy today is part of teams. And I've been incredibly fortunate to be part of like a, a brilliant team, a bit of a dream team uh, with, with, uh, with this work. And it really wouldn't have been possible without all these smart and incredibly intelligent people around me. So really, I just want to acknowledge my, my collaborators, uh, 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 
Luciana at, at UNSW who took the Spectra, Barnaby and, and Mark who did a lot of the uh, hard work on the infrared data reduction of this project, Paul Crowther and Perija Williams who are a bit of domain experts and I got very lucky to uh, talking about non-virtual conferences, running into Paul at coffee and having his expert eyes cast over what I'm about to discuss today. But I think the two biggest thanks really need to extend firstly to, to Ben Pope, who has this kind of cutting and insightful way of looking at problems and really led to a breakthrough in this project uh, just with a few quibs and, and, and casting his eye also over the system. But really, I just want to finish my last thanks, uh, go to uh, Peter Tuthill with, without this project wouldn't have been possible. But everything about Peter, uh, for me, is, he's been a true mentor in every meaning of the word. Um, he's cared about my career and provided me with opportunities when he has had no direct responsibility to me at all. I've never been Peter's student, never been Peter's postdoc, but uh, yeah, this is an opportunity where he really carved out space for me, and I, I just want to thank him uh, for that. And without 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 him, this this work wouldn't have been possible, and this prize wouldn't have been possible. All right, now the, the gushy thanks are out of the way. Let's get uh, into the the, the, the the meat of the talk. I thought, how, how could I give this talk that would be engaging probably to a broad audience? I could sit down and, and walk, walk through the science, but I think people have already had a lot of that today. I know it's late in the evening. So I thought I'd kind of give a, a, story, a story of discovery tied in with the science and might, uh, might also help some students in the audience or even postdocs in the audience. This paper, the, the discovery of this star to publication was five years. And this goes to show that science this isn't a direct story, right? There's many different paths that can follow and where you're walking is never clear. And so I think it's a really nice uh, kind of microcosm of how modern science is done. You know, tacking on team members with different expertise and also just trying to figure out whatever you got, right? This, this story I'm about to tell you isn't a, a story of like, I've got an idea, I wrote a telescope proposal, I got the data, it was what I expected, I wrote the paper and, and the story is complete like that. This was very much found something weird, didn't know what to expect, threw everything we had at it, and we kind of emerge with something at the end. <laughs> so let's get underway with that story. So um, casting my uh, eye back in a long time ago in a, far, a place far away. So I'm, sitting, I'm currently sitting in, in the north of the Netherlands. And when I originally started this work um, and I, I, we found this star system, I was actually an honors student working with Brian Gainsler and uh, Sean Farrell at University of Sydney. And Brian had set my honors project to be incredibly broad. Uh, in retrospect, I, I think it was probably too broad for an honors student, but and end of the day, we found something interesting in anyway. But the point of the honors project was more or less to find interesting things that were in the X-ray and radio sky. And so I just developed a cross-matching routine to cross-match XMM data with all types of radio data. Um, for, it's not important which exact ones, but this is MGPS2, the galactic plane. And I found a weird source that really stood out just in luminosity. Um, so on the left here is, a, is the XMM detection. On the right, you can see uh, a Malonglo detection right at the center there. And this thing was incredibly bright in X-ray and radio, but not known to the literature. It just had a catalog name. Nothing was really uh, decided about it at all. It's just known to be X-ray bright. Kind of looked stellar in, in the X-ray spectrum. And that was, that was it. Um, what really caught our attention, however, which is kind of interesting how things kind of slide through the gaps, is once we cross match and considered its infrared properties as all observers do, you know, you kind of just accumulate all the information you can across the electromagnetic spectrum to try and figure out what you found. We found it was incredibly dusty. So we're talking about going from a V band magnitude of 17 to being one of the brightest mid infrared objects in the sky. So bright it saturates Spitzer and along these lines. So what can saturate Spitzer, but not be a known object in the literature? Um, was uh, one of the premises here. And obviously you got lots of extreme environment with the X-ray and radio emission. So you can kind of see the pieces of the puzzles laying together here. I'm an honor student trying to figure all this out, but obviously you run out of time with your honors project and you can't, you can't, you have to write up your thesis and get it submitted. And we kind of were left with like three, three kind of alternatives to what could fit the art, particularly the literature data. So we've got on the left, maybe like a young stellar object, massive stars form, you can form, uh, uh, you can get jets in the system and, and, and accretion events which can drive X-ray emission. The other one, which obviously, now we know the end answer, right? This is why I didn't want to just tell the story as this pure science, one single thread story that we sometimes do when we give our talks and our papers, is maybe it's a massive star at the end of its life. That could also fit with some of the characteristics. And the one that was actually leading right at the end was particularly what's called a symbiotic X-ray binary. This is the idea you have maybe a red giant and you have a mass transfer event with a compact object, white dwarf, whatever. Um, so these were all 
potential scenarios, but I obviously have to write up. Peter here knew the only way to really make progress in trying to understand this object we discovered is through imaging this infrared, seeing what type of patterns. So you can already see what you'd expect is quite vastly different between these objects if you image these at high enough resolution. And obviously Spitzer and, and Wise didn't provide that with us in the infrared. So we wrote a VLT proposal and time passed. So that's the end of like 2013 and our paper gets published in 2015. What goes on? Well, we get incredibly unlucky. Um, essentially, we try to shoehorn a couple uh, uh, observations at the back end of other proposals. Uh, um, didn't work out. We also got incredibly unlucky with weather at the VLT a couple times and things keep going. I start a PhD working uh, with Brian and Ron and, and, and Elaine and, and Randall on radio galaxy evolution um, with the Murchison White Field Array. Um, so I don't have time to be thinking and wondering about weird infrared objects in the galactic plane. I'm trying to write a thesis. And so many years passed, but we do get managed to get a, 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 a observation, but I haven't got time to look at it. And Peter obviously didn't have time to look at it. And it's kind of funny because while I'm writing up my conclusions chapter of my PhD, this, uh, we realize that, hang on, we better reduce this data because um, if we don't, uh, it's actually going to go public and someone could, anyone could access this and, and, and produce, uh, produce the image or, or reduce the science. And we don't know if there's anything interesting there. Um, we have some engagement from the literature, but maybe there's something cool there. And this is the image that pretty much came off raw from, from reducing the data. I, I, like, as, as a radio astronomer, I remember pretty much just opening the base fits file that comes from the VLT, and this is pretty much what it's produced. This is just a Vizier 8.9 micron image. It's got a superposition of, of a narco image in the blue on top, but this beautiful spiral structure immediately grabs you. Um, it kind of pains me as a radio astronomer to say, uh, this is probably the best image I'll ever make in my career, even if my career expands 50 years. You know, uh, This is just or something really special to jump out at you. And this isn't a simulation, this just exists in the universe. So it's really like this lovely uh, kind of spiral pattern that kind of reminds you of some of the Archimedean spirals you see in pinwheel nebulae, which we'll touch in a second. I bet you've got extra entrainment features and all kinds of extra interesting stuff. As I mentioned, you can kind of see these two blue features at the center. Um, uh, it, it, this is just narco imaging, two micron imaging, it's just high resolution. And you can see it resolves it into two objects. One in the north, we call the Northern Companion. Not important, just a spectator. If you're interested in, in the details about that star, let me know. But at the center, uh, the heart of, of our pep, uh, you, we've got um, an unresolved binary, which I'll discuss in a second. And so this image is obviously very pretty, but what's really fascinating about our pep, and which I'll, I'll touch on now in more depth, is that the physics uh, associated with this imagery is really made, is really, uh, confounded ideas about how massive stars end their lives and really uh, caused a, a bit of grief for us to figure out how, how this system is actually evolving and changing. What does that mean about the stars at the center? So just to kind of emphasize just one further thing, right at the heart of our PEP is what's called two wolf rays stars. So for the students in the audience, this is just uh, two, two uh, infrared spectra, normalized flux, so normalized in terms of continuum and from about 1.1 to 2.4 micron, and what you should grab you straight away is there's no hydrogen in, in this spectrum. Um, and the lines that you can see are incredibly broad and they're all helium and high ionization uh, 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 atoms. So you've got helium two, carbon three, carbon four. And so this is a, a telltale signature of a wolf ray star. If you go and look closer and do a couple more uh, observations, particularly at the shorter wavelengths, which we've done, We've actually not just got one wolf ray star in this system, we've actually got two, which is the first time such a system has been discovered in uh, our Milky Way. And it also kind of helps us understand some of the extreme properties I'm about to describe. So that's kind of the story up to this point of producing this image. Now I'm going to tell a little bit more of a linear science story only because I haven't got uh, <laughs> hours to explain the various kind of directions we attack this problem. But uh, this hopefully gives you an idea of just the many different paths um, and the long time that you can actually take with trying to figure all this stuff out. So just to, to reset, what, what are Wolf-Rey stars and why are they interesting? So Wolf-Rey stars just represent the end phase of the most massive stars in our, our, our universe. So greater than 20 solar mass, 25 solar mass. They're incredibly rare in terms of lifespan. Less than 10% of these massive stars' uh, life are spent in this phase. So that's why it's reasonably rare to find these systems uh, to, uh, two, two in the same system. 
And what's interesting, well, mind you, that's obviously incredibly complex, as I'm sure LIGO people uh, in the audience will be very aware of. Binary evolution of massive stars is, is a very hot, top, hot topic and very, very difficult problem to solve. Um, uh, and they're most likely progenitors, not to the short GRBs, that, uh, like a, a binary neutron star merger, but the long duration GRBs and core collapse supernovae. And very, I know they're, they're rare stars, but they just produce so much mass into the uh, environment that they're very important for enriching the interstellar medium. Now, as I mentioned LIGO people, one of the cool things about massive stars is that they often always form with another companion massive star. And so what they then form is what's called a colliding wind binary. And I'm just giving you a simulation over here on the right. At the center, what you've got is a wolf ray star. And quite often, as I said, normally they're not found with another wolf ray star. They're usually found with just another O type star, another massive star. And because a wolf ray star has such strong winds, we're talking thousands of kilometers a second, very high mass loss, like 10 to the minus four uh, solar masses per year they can really dominate the momentum ratio of the system. And so what you get is this shock forming around the companion. And this shock can be very, very bright in X-ray and non-thermal radiation. But one of the fascinating things, and this is the stuff that Peter worked on in particular in the 90s, is that you can have a huge amount of dust formation, which is quite a contentious thing when you think about it. This is, you've got so much X-ray photons, UV photons flying around in this system. How can you get something like dust forming? But the idea is most likely it occurs in the wake of the companion. Hopefully you can see my mouse here. And so what happens is you form kind of in the shadow of the companion and this then gets wrapped up in by the orbital elements. As the star rotates, you can see it gets impacted by the wolf ray, uh, uh, wolf ray star. And so this is really a powerful tool then, these gliding wind binaries, to trace mass loss history and extract all these orbital parameters directly from images rather than trying to play around with models. Um, and so as I've mentioned before, uh, this work um, was really uh, opened up in the 90s by Peter Tuttle uh, and his team. And he's, oh, sorry, but, all right. So yeah, and, and uh, what you can see here is uh, a very famous one, Wolfray 104. Um, and this is just Peter coming back consecutive evenings. And what you can see is this kind of beautiful Archimedean spiral that is wrapping up and encoding all this information uh, about the system in terms of its, its mass loss and also, um, the, the wind parameters and the orbital parameters. So, okay, so then if we've got a pinwheel nebula, like a classic pinwheel nebula that Peter found in the 90s, we should go back a year later with, with RPEP, um, that, 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 that beautiful pattern I showed earlier, and take a photo and we should expect rotation, just like you're seeing here. And that's what we did. Well, well luckily enough, because like it's been, a, we took so long to look at the data, um, essentially a lot of time had passed. And so we came back with a year epoch, hoping to see some evolution in the pattern. And this is what we got. We didn't see anything like a, a, a lovely um, turning pattern. More or less, we just saw something very, very similar. And this is where the story of RPEP just goes from being a pretty system to actually being something really interesting in terms of the physics of how massive stars die. Because actually what's happening is between 2017 and 2018, when we took the data, um, it's only been an ever so slight evolution. Now it's not stagnant by any stretch of the imagination. There's just been a slight evolution and it's all been kind of in the same, uh, kind of an evolution in a, a radial direction. So just to maybe emphasize this a little bit better. Five minutes, is, Joe. Five yeah, minutes. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, and what I've done here is passed, uh, just done a high pass filter on the 2017 data and the 2018 data. This is just to emphasize the ridges. And you can kind of see if you've got expert eyes squinting at your, well, we're back in lecture theaters in Australia. You must be, might be far away, but other people will be squinting at their laptops. And you can kind of see there's been some slight evolution at different uh, at edges here. And so what you actually have to our consternation when we first saw this was quite a slow wind in the dust. So if you actually look at these little, these little just like essentially pixel evolutions in the dust pattern we're seeing here, rather than this beautiful rotation, what's happening is we've got a wind on the order of 700. I mean, we've got a dust motion on the order of 750 kilometers a second. Now that's very different to what we should expect. In all the other pinwheels, what we find is that the dust is moving at exactly the speed that the gas is in the system. And we know what this, this spectroscopic wind is from the system because we have P sigmi profiles. We know RPEP, this, this, this system on the route, which we, we nicknamed RPEP because of the patterns and the correlation with that snake on my first slide. 
um, has winds that are, are 3,400 kilometers a second, They're greater than 2,000. So we have this kind of discrepancy between the gas and the dust in a way that no other uh, kind of pinwheel or wolf ray collider wind binary has uh, seen. And to really kind of give you an idea of why this is a problem, it's like kind of finding a feather sitting still in a cyclone, right? Like you just don't expect to find something like that. So the equivalent here is remember I mentioned the dust kind of forms in the wake in, the, in this kind of shadow. What happens is the O type star or the companion moves out of it and it just gets accelerated. This, this dust as it gets produced just gets impacted by the Wolf Ray star and immediately accelerated up to very fast speeds. So the question then becomes, well, how can we solve this problem uh, of the discrepancy between the gas in the system and the dust speed? And so there's, there's a couple of easy ones. One is go, well, maybe we've got the distance to RPEP really wrong, right? Because this is proper motion in the sky. If we can just put RPEP it instead of two kiloparsecs, let's put it at 10 kiloparsecs, that, that solves a lot of our issues. And we can't do that, unfortunately. We've got restrictions on distance from kinematic estimates in, in the uh, spectra. But also, if we do do that, RPEP becomes the brightest, uh, most luminous uh, X-ray, radio, infrared, stellar object in the sky by an order of magnitude. Um, so it's already rivaling Eta Carina in terms of a lot of the brightness arguments. And then to put it at, a, uh, put it at 10 kiloparsecs would just, uh, uh, well, it would, it would uh, I don't think a lot of the X-ray and radio physics would quite work out the way we'd like. Um, the other alternative, which is kind of just, well, maybe we're, we're witnessing a really special transition state of the system. But there's a few reasons that really doesn't work. One, it's a very privileged moment of time, which always makes you highly suspicious. We have to be like in a very niche kind of 10 year interval. Um, and the other one is that if it, we did see that, why is this plume so, so symmetric and so, so elegant right now? You'd expect disruption to be occurring in a way, but we can model all of this as a showing to the right here. Um, work particularly done by Yuno know, Han, I should have mentioned on the previous slide, um, uh, that uh, really understood that we, geometrically we can describe this perfectly without needing changing states or anything like that. Just pure physics of, of a colliding wind binary can produce the pattern we're seeing here. So nothing really suggests that we're seeing something uh, changing in, in the system in terms of like maybe one of the Wolf Ray stars is changing phases or something like that. Our best model, the one that we proposed, and it's by no means the correct model, but it's our best guess of what we think is going on here. And I'm um, very happy to hear alternatives as well, is that potentially that one of the Wolf Ray stars, let's call it the central one for the sake of argument, at the center is uh, producing both the fast and slow winds. And how, how could you do something like this? This is just a nice little diagram that you now put together. One proposition we have is maybe one of the Wolf Ray stars at the center is rapidly rotating. And so what happens is you kind of have very slow wind coming from the equator just because of surface gravity arguments that is quite dense. And at the poles, you still have this very fast wind. And so what happens is when the other binary companion, the other Wolf Ray star, it's not so important, comes through this kind of uh, more dense, dusty kind of disc around the star, that's when you get the dust production. And that kind of can turn on, uh, that, that can turn on and off as the star moves on out, in and out, which is predicted by our models as well. And so this is a, a, a really nice, interesting prediction, the idea that we're seeing anisotropic mass loss, as in masses occurring differently in different directions in Y1 Wolf Ray star. And one implication of this, and this is the origin of it, is that potentially then if, the, if a star is rapidly rotating in the middle of RPEP, um, then that could be exactly what you expect for a gamma ray burst progenitor system. Uh, so that's uh, just what long duration bursts require. And that's really interesting because if we have such a system galactically, we can really probe a lot of GRB progenitor models, which before this system was only really available at cosmological distances. GRBs happen really far away. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of the, the summary of, of, of the science of what we've got here. Um, obviously, when have you got a pretty picture and a, a story about a star about to go bang, uh, the media grabs attention to it. And so when we first published this, it was a, a, lot, a lot of fun to have, I know, ABC calling up CBC, you know, bad astronomy writing stuff, new scientists. It was uh, incredibly a lot of fun. And uh, it goes to show also like it was really, I know like really rewarding to me because like one of the, the goals of a scientist and an astronomer obviously is to activate public's imagination. Don't get me wrong. Obviously uh, the press tends to take things to the extreme, you know, ticking time bomb was a, a regular one, you know, that's not always 
the best way, but like at least I got people thinking about space and 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 astronomy, and I think that was a, a really rewarding experience. And the the final one of the most recent ones, because this is kind of what's awesome as well when you publish something, it's kind of taken a life on its own. You know, it's got its own Wikipedia stuff. Other people have written and had fun with it, um, just all because of a pretty picture and a fun story. Um, and recently, in fun minute. Of, yes, I just last slide now. Sorry, John. Um, the fun part of it is that just recently a, a documentary with uh, Littlefinger, Lord Baelish, the Game of Thrones fan, it's about the star and killers of the cosmos, which uh, should be a lot of fun, and about the era of Discovery Channel. What a, what a laugh. Anyway, um, so just to conclude, science is messy, multi-part. Um, I, I have a few more points here, but I'm running out of time. Really interesting object um, uh, that made our ideas of how massive stars die uh, a little bit different. And uh, yeah, well, maybe it's a local analog to a GRB progenitor system, but I just want to end there saying thanks again to, to my team, P Peter in particular, and, and the ASA, and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, congratulations, Joe. Really interesting piece of work. And uh, as Kath has just said in the uh, Slack, very deserving of the Webster Prize. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of questions. The first question was actually withdrawn. Um, the question was from uh, Gilles Zhang about the scale of that, inf that uh, uh, infrared image that you had. But you then showed a picture that had the angular scale on it. But uh, did I miss a linear scale? Yeah, sorry, I did take that off. They, it's quite huge in terms of angular scale. So there's about 12 arc seconds by 12 arc seconds that, that, uh, that dust plume are showing in the mid-infrared. Um, which is quite larger than the standard pinwheel nebula. A lot of the pinwheel nebula would almost fit into the center of this image. So right. the dust production is on an extra large scale here because this thing's at about two kiloparsecs as well. Right. Uh, Ruby Wright asked a question that was occurred, occurred to me as well. Have you accounted for any projection effects or tried modeling this in 3D from different viewing angles? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I kind of tried to allude to that. Uh, this is particularly work done by, the, uh, by you know, Han. We did do it in our 2019 paper as well, a kind of a geometric model. Maybe if I just share my screen super quickly. Um, uh, yeah, so we have a kind of a, a good geometric model. You can kind of see it here, right? So this is kind of the 3D effect. You kind of have this cone of production around it. Um, so we've tried our best to kind of recover that type of structure in the 3D, but obviously we don't have 3D information. That's uh, maybe about to be uh, Nicole's uh, question um, about follow-up observations. I don't know. Did that answer your question? The answer is like, uh, we don't really know. We don't have a huge handle on the 3D structure of the system. We kind of have an idea, but obviously we don't have uh, depth effects. And a uh, question from Daniel Price. Did you manage to reproduce app in simulations? What is this? This is some language I don't understand. Uh, I I think RPEP, it's, it's spelled A-P-E-P. -E -P. I think he's trying to say RPEP. Um, yeah, so to answer Nicole's question as well as Danny's. So, uh, Nicole, yes, um, follow-up observations with Alma, fingers crossed. I was, <laughs> you know how hard it is to get Alma time. Uh, that would hopefully, if we got CO detection, that would give us the kinematic structure and then we could do some of the 3D modeling, hopefully in a better de depth. Um, to reproduce simulations, uh, this is a good question, Danny. There's a, there's a professor here at Leiden, uh, uh, Simon uh, Portugal Swart, who's a, a bit of an expert here as well in this stuff. And we've got plans for a master student to potentially try and do particularly radiative transfer observations, see if we can recover that, that structure as well. Okay, well, I think we better move on to the last talk. Thanks very much. Uh, another very, very good talk. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Joe. <laughs> Thank All right, thanks, John. Okay, so our final speaker for the day is Maria Bergman. Maria's there, yes, um, from uh, Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, calling in from the other side of the planet. And uh, she's going to tell us about some extreme events in galactic chemical evolution. So um, I'll give you a five minute warning after 15 minutes. That should leave five minutes for questions, okay? Thank you, John. Cheers. Give me a moment. Okay, let's see. All right. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Hello, yes? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, um, thank you, John. Thank you, and I'd like First, uh, thank, you, uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to present 
our work at the meeting. So um, um, first of all, I'd like to point out these are not the extreme events that you see here. These are my group members and um, I'm, these are amazing people and they really play a huge, huge role in the work that I'll talk about today. So let me start with a brief introduction of the extreme events. Which events are we talking about? So the extreme events in the context of, my, of this talk are those that inject energy and chemical elements into galaxies and that drive their chemical and dynamical evolution. And thereby they set their present day structure, their morphology, which is of course fundamental to many different fields. And maybe just a decade ago, our basic picture of such events was mostly limited to these three types that you see here, core collapse, SN1As, AGB stars. But of course, things changed forever recently. So with the systems like compact binary mergers, neutron star mergers, neutron star black hole mergers, peculiar types of super core collapse supernovae, magnetars, collapsars, but also more extreme exotic types of systems like, that may explode like SN1As, um, these appeared on the horizon just a few years ago. And these are very exciting because those systems are all in the focus of gravitational wave astrophysics, they are associated with gamma ray bursts, they drive cosmic nucleosynthesis, and they are, of course, our connection to the first stars and high redshift universe. And it's really important to understand them, to constrain them. And uh, how can we do this? There are, of course, several ways. We can try to catch them in real time directly, but there is another method. And I'll try to convince you here that this other method is just as powerful. And this method is to study the chemical abundances in stars that are enriched by those events. And now we are really in a remarkable situation here because with the advent of large photometric, astro uh, spectroscopic, astrometric surveys, in particular GALA that is run in Australia, we now have access to millions of stellar spectra in the Milky Way galaxy. Also, a lot of work goes on the development of spectral models of stellar radiative transfer models that account for the effects of 3D convection, non lt radiative transfer. And I will not have time to talk about this, but I have to stress that this has been really instrumental in boosting the accuracy of chemical abundances in stars, metallicities of stars, that altogether more data, better data, higher quality data now allow us to build detailed, comprehensive maps of chemical compositions of stars and their evolution with the metallicity in the galaxy, with age, with the position of stars in the Milky Way. And with this, we can actually compare those data sets that you see here with dots, with models of galactic chemical evolution. So models that predict the chemical enrichment for every single element in the periodic table. And these models rely on nucleosynthesis yields and on the evolutionary time scales of all those sources. And this shows us really the, how this method really unfolds its full potential presently. So it's now becoming possible to constrain the intrinsic physical properties of those systems here. The, their dependence on the environment, on metallicity, on, um, um, on the environment, exploiting this amazing multidimensionality in the chemical in the chemical, in the space of chemical abundances. And I will show you some examples that highlight some of the capabilities of the galactic enrichment studies. And one of those examples has far reaching consequences for our understanding of galactic chemical evolution of SN1A systems, and maybe also for cosmology. So this is about SN1A systems. Supernova 1A are, as we all know, best probes of the cosmic expansion history. But the main and sole problem about them is whether those systems are really a class of homogeneous objects whose visual brightness scales with distance. So, which is uh, why they received this uh, fancy um, term, whether they are standard candles. And this primarily depends on their progenitors, on their explosion mechanisms, which has not, which is not understood yet. Because if we start with two main sequence binaries, we may get very different outcomes for the explosions. And there are currently three hotly debated scenarios. One, a double degenerate system, where we have two white dwarfs on the close orbit that uh, lose energy and momentum to the gravitational waves and eventually merge, producing a so-called sub-Chandra Seca mass explosion. Then we have white dwarf with a non-degenerate component may create helium from the companion, and this eventually triggers a surface helium detonation and another 
detonation at the core, which may also produce a subchamber acetamas, um, supernova 1A. And finally, we have the canonical form in which a mass transfer from a companion leads to a slow buildup of mass and until the chandra seca mass is reached, and that leads to core ignition and runaway fusion. So what is amazing, and that was really realized actually in models a um, long time ago, is that there are certain pairs of chemical elements that can be used to constrain the SN1A progenitors and their explosion physics. And the reason is relatively simple. These elements, which you see here, manganese, nickel, they require extremely high temperatures and densities, which are only achieved in explosive burning. So of all these elements, manganese is probably most exciting. It's in, it has a single isotope, it's neutron rich. And so in canonical Chandrasekhar mass models, which have a very high density to get to this, what's called nucle nuclear statistical equilibrium, which is pretty much the Sahai equilibrium for atoms, but in nuclear physics. So in canonical Chandrasekhar mass models, those densities and this neutronization is easily achieved due to electron captures. So as a result, if we consider different SN1A types, different models of SN1A, different explosion models, near Chandrasekhar, sub Chandrasekhar, we find that all of them have their own manganese fingerprints, manganese or iron, which differ. And this is the log 10 scale by a factor of two to five. And this, these signatures are easily measurable in stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And so where we are currently, and uh, so until recently, what was the situation is that most of the galactic enrichment studies relied on the data determined using the LTE, 1D, LTE models. And there was no evidence for any problem associated with such canonical near Chandra Sekamas channel. So this picture has been around for years. Those data points here are our LTE observations of stars in the Milky Way. And the line is the model computed using the standard explosion mechanism, the canonical Chandra Sekamas. Now, as it turns out, explore, employing state-of-the-art non-LT radiative transfer models, and here non-LT just refers to self-consistent solution of statistical equilibrium in stellar atmospheres and radiative transfer. And this really changes the perspective, kind of leads to a paradigm shift, because now here we have the data points all across the entire Talisti range in the Milky Way, and the galactic chemical and evolution model that is needed to describe these data requires a dominant contribution from a sub, sub Chandra Seca mass channel, which has so far been viewed as too exotic and too rare to influence the Milky Way. Now, here, interesting recent support to our work came from other groups who, all, who used high resolution data in the Milky Way, in particular in accreted halo population, but also in dwarf spheroidal galaxies, uh, different metallicities to investigate the patterns of nickel and manganese abundances. And what they found is also quite exciting and supports that some. Um, the evidence that the canonical Chandrasekhar mass models can practically be ruled out as the sole source of chemical enrichment. So in both studies, they found that a very significant fraction of sub Chandrasekhar mass models is needed to explain the data. And this is important. It actually has many ramifications for all the fields in astronomy. So on the one hand, so all this evidence that is piling up now may throw overboard the canonical understanding of galaxy formation, which is usually based on the ratio of enrichment between core collapse and SM1A systems, but also challenge the applicability, the type 1A supernovae in a standard candles in cosmology. Because uh, in all these uh, non-canonical scenarios, the total mass of the merging white dwarfs may vary significantly, and so the luminosity may also vary. And that's what there are interesting studies that show that, in fact, two most common types of supernova 1A sub um, Chandra Seca mass models do not, in fact, conform to this canonical Phillips relationship, which is fundamental to cosm observational cosmology. So now let's talk, turn to another example. And here I will try to say a few words about how do we constrain more extreme sources, compact binary mergers, massive rotating stars, nuclear synthesis and accretion disks of black holes, and so on. So for this, we first have to look at the nuclear physics. So um, we all know production of nuclei beyond iron cannot proceed by thermonuclear fusion. That means all these species here have to form somehow else. And they form by capturing neutrons onto seed nuclei and by subsequent beta decays. So S process here, the slow neutron capture, follows along the path, along the valley of beta stability, whereas in R process, 
neutron, the nuclei managed to capture neutrons much, much faster than the, than the time scales of beta decays. So the R process, progenitor nuclei occupy a very abundant, a very um, neutron rich, unstable area in that chart. And so what happens is that the aftermath of these processes can be seen in the solar abundance distributions with S process elements here showing three peaks corresponding to the magic neutron shell closures, whereas R process abundance maxima are shifted to lighter nuclei it's due to the combination of neutron binding energy and beta decay rates. So, and the remarkable thing is now we can get these abundance distributions, not only for the sun, but we can actually with high resolution, with high resolution spectra, with large facilities, we can also trace them in other stars in the Milky Way. So let's first consider the S process, slow neutron capture process. And this process is despite its apparent simplicity, is actually not understood at all. It's thought to occur in AGB stars and in massive stars. But considering all these three peaks, the first, second, and the third, we see that there is still a huge mismatch between predictions of the galaxy models and the data. And that could be, of course, on the one hand, because of the still incomplete understanding of the AGB evolution, like the size of the carbon-13 pockets of the rotation or mass loss, or due to physics of early rotating massive stars. And indeed, recent studies suggest that rotation, in fact, greatly enhances the production of those species at low metallicity due to rotation-induced mixing between the and the hydrogen shell and helium core. And also still very little is known about the I process, intermediate process that uh, may also operate in AGB stars. Well, ultimately there is another attractive possibility that the abundances that we measure in metal poor stars are still biased and they are affected by poorly understood effects of normalcy and convection, which especially set in, in metal poor stars. And this is what my postdoc is currently looking at. So now let's talk about R process. So this is really one of the holy grails of modern nuclear astrophysics. And it has been long hypothesized, theoretically, that this process happens in extreme events like neutron star mergers. And the first direct evidence that this is really happening in those extreme conditions came from the detection of strontium in the spectra of the kilonova, which is associated with a neutron star merger. And uh, my group member, Camilla Hansen, co-led this work. This is remarkable. But actually, also indirectly, we now have plenty of evidence that metal poor stars show gigantic spreads in their R process abundances. But mostly, this is currently limited to europium, the key R process element that suggests that sites with negligible iron production, low event rate, high ejector masses contributed to that spread. On the other hand, um, this is challenging because there are other studies based on smaller samples very small stellar samples, find a very stable, remarkably stable R process patterns in metal poor stars in the galactic halo. And this evidence also recently came from the analysis of ultra-faint um, of uh, ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, so the galactic satellites, which calls, which can be interpreted as the universality of R process. And this is odd because that means that this process, R process, must have been operating in a very remarkable, rem very, very stable way over the entire period of the entire 13 billion years of galactic evolution. So now, how that, does that mesh with theoretical understanding? So this, this, this result sparked enormous interest in modeling, in modeling of explosions over the past years. And this model showed that several sites, in fact, appear to produce very robust R process patterns, at least for the second, and the third peak R process elements, which includes mergers of neutron stars, neutron stars and black holes, but also this exotic core collapse supernovae, magnetars, collapsars. However, the peculiar discovery here is that the actual patterns that all these scenarios produce strongly depend on the physical conditions on those sites. They depend on the neutrino luminosity, on the time delays between merger and the black hole formation, the properties of the black hole accretion disk itself, mass rotation, and um, especially in this, in this scenario, MRI supernovae on the magnetic field. So more, even more exciting is that it turns out that the abundance ratios, in particular European over iron, but also the others, also very sensitive 
to the physics, to the subgrid physics of galaxy formation. And the five particular minutes. depends on the, hello? Sorry, Maria, five minutes. Yes, thank you, John. So they depend, among others, on the gas flows, on the cooling in the interstellar medium. It was shown in the recent paper by Schoenrich and Weinberg. So they depend on the time delay distributions of these events, but on the coalescence time itself. And currently there is no unique way to reproduce the observables that we see, the, the, the scatter and the trend that we see in the Milky Way, not even for Europa. So where do we stand? So on the one hand, of course, the field of stellar, stellar and galactic archaeology is booming owing to these large spectroscopic surveys. However, even now, we still are in the limits of very small number statistics for heavy and those exotic elements that actually form two thirds of the periodic table. And most, even more, even more, even more um, frustrating is that for most of these elements, Iron Peak S and R process, more detailed, more accurate 3D non LT abundance measurements are still missing. So, also from the perspective of models of explosions and nuclear synthesis, there, are, there is a remarkable diversity of scenarios that were put forward to explain the observations. However, the currently available models are very customized, the parameter spaces vastly incomplete and mostly the, the analysis performed by comparing those models to the sun and a few metal poor stars. Now for a comprehensive investigation, of course, we need a very a large parametric studies of sensitive chemical tracers that cover all these events. And finally, also from the perspective of galactic chemical evolution models. So the current limitation is that mo the majority of models still ignore such critical events like influence of stellar dynamics on the, on the key distributions on the distributions in the age, metallicity, age abundance space, but also the element processing in the multi-phase ISM and uh, ultimately also not only the abundance ratios, but also their galactic trends and evolutions of the dispersions, which may, the dispersion of abundances, which may ultimately hold the clue to the, to how to disentangle all these extreme scenarios that pollute, polluted the galaxy with S process. Our process, I process. So the, the, all of this remains to be quantified. Now, what is the future? And the future is actually much more exciting. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll, soon we will have large new facilities. Foremost, we've SDSS is now uh, uh, starting to observe the galaxy SDSS five. They will provide access to a much greater volume in the Milky Way. They will, of course, we will have a much better data quality, but we are also working on, on uh, improving the spectroscopic models to include 3D non OT effects. And here I'd like to mention the formidable HR survey that I co lead, where we actually aim to address the, the limitations of the current data sets. We will have access to hundreds of thousands of galactic stars with high resolution spectra with sufficient signal to noise and the coverage in the in the very important blue wavelength range which hosts all these weak signatures of SI and R process and we expect that with those data sets we actually will have will be able to make a qualitative step in the detailed studies of chemical composition of stars and their relation to the synthesis of elements in extreme astrophysical conditions to, but also this will yield constraints, of course, on the physical properties of the progenitors, the evolution with the multiplicity, rotation, metallicity, on the chemical substructure in the Milky Way. And actually, it's now becoming possible to also do this detailed sp stellar spectroscopy for resolved stellar populations and other local group galaxies. That means we can probe the chemical enrichment of galaxies of the entire range of ages and environments. And of course, the results in this field will provide a deep understanding of other, other fields like galaxy evolution in general and all these exotic um, hypothesized um, events like dark matter and mixed objects where sub chandrasekhar mass models have now um, have been proposed as among the most exciting candidates for this, but also observational cosmology, of course, because um, we'll be able to test the, the entire population of type 1a supernovae and their relate and their applicability as standard candles. And of course, all this, um, all these facilities, large spectroscopic facilities are highly complementary to 
other next generation instruments, Eero, Zeta, Plato, Lisa, which will provide us with a much, with the evolution of, um, will provide us with the much more complete picture on the evolution interaction of objects and wide and compact binary objects and mass functional binaries and their population statistics and their role as progenitors of all these extreme species that I talked about. Um, and here I would like to stop. John, I'm not so sure, am I, um, how much time do I have? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, uh, well, I'll just because, stop and take questions here. Yep, yep, that's very good. Thanks very much, uh, uh, great talk. Well, speaking personally, I, I really enjoyed it. Now we have a few questions. Do, uh, Mike Creel asks, do these robust R processes also have extremely high neutron counts similar to the R processes that were deemed unstable? I'm not sure I know what that means, but it's more important that you know. Uh, John, could you repeat the question, please? Whether Certainly. these R processes, yes? Do these robust R processes also have these extremely high neutron counts similar to the R processes that were deemed unstable? Extremely high neutron counts. Yeah, I don't, I don't fully understand that. Are you referring to models or observations? Mike, uh, could un is Mike B, could unmute and ask a question in words, verbally, orally. No? Maybe you can answer that. Maybe you can answer that later in the in the uh, in the Slack channel. Okay. Um, okay. Sarah Martel asks, "How tunable are the yields from supernova models?" And as an aging cynical theorist, I'd say they're one hundred percent tunable. Whatever you want. But over to Maria to answer. Yes. I, uh, how tunable are the yields in quark lab supernovae? Is that the question? Yes. 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 Okay, so I think, um, so right now it is indeed a big question. So what are the yields of four collapse supernovae, in fact? So there we are still um, a little bit in the uncertainty because there are different, different uh, uh, sources of the core collapse yields. And of course this, uh, um, it's, it's not so easy to constrain them. So, but the good thing about those core collapse models is that there we actually have a very good, um, we have a very good constraint on the metal core side. So the, uh, in the lowest metallicity regime in the galactic halo, that's where we expect purely the, the enrichment due to core collapse supernovae. So not so, not so much by any other sites. So potentially I think there is quite, it is relatively, um, uh, so there is some understanding of how much tuning is needed to reproduce the observations in the metal core domain. So I think already the, the classical Wuslin Weaver yields were not, not so far from the reality and they're still used in the majority of uh, galactic enrichment studies. Now there are also more recent yields, but also yields that um, which may differ in some of the elements, but I must say that in those particular, in, in these elements, we, we still need better data to actually confirm that these newer yields, and I think these are Kobayashi's group that um, also propose even more energetic core collapse, so that these are the hypernovae here, is we still need better data to actually confirm that these newer yields are, are needed or not, so are more realistic than the previous ones. I'm not sure whether I answered the question or not. Uh, I think so. Yes, okay. Now I have two questions here that are related, so I'll give you both of them at once. Mark Dura asks, could misidentified sub Chandrasekhar supernova 1As fix the H0 tension? And uh, related to that, Sarah Martel asked, are you suggesting that NLTE effects could resolve the Hubble tension? Um. For the H0, I'm not so sure though, because for the H0, these, are, these measurements are mostly based on the local galaxies, I say the, um, the low redshift. So the H0 determination is mostly um, sensitive to low redshift galaxies. So I think for H0, we will, this, 
it is unlikely that those measurements will really qualitatively or quantitatively change the, the, the estimate of H0 at any significant degree. However, for higher redshift galaxies, higher redshift galaxies, which are mostly also more metal poor, that's where we might see some differences, I think. And this is more important for, for other cosmological parameters, like I think the dark energy equation of state, possibly. That's where very small changes with metallicity, systematic changes with metallicity of the galaxy may actually play a role. And the other question was by Sarah on the non-LT measurements. Yes, could non-LTE yes. measurements resolve the controversy, e.g. the disagreement between 1A and CFE values? I think, um, yes. The, whether they could resolve the controversy, I do not know. But the one thing is for sure, the local H0 measurements are based on Cepheids observed in galaxies with SM1As. So the SM1A scale is tied to measurements of Cepheids, to the period luminosity relationship of Cepheids. However, there is more and more evidence coming that it's not just the period luminosity, but also period luminosity metallicity dependence. That means we still need to understand the metallicities of those Cepheids and whether the systematic distance, the, the distance scale that is tied to Cepheids and Tesla 1As really depends on the metallicity, in fact, that we have not yet so far encountered for in those local H0 measurements. Right. Okay, well, I think that's basically answered all of the questions. So thank you very much uh, for, for that excellent talk, Maria. And uh, again, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and uh, especially the prize winners uh, as part of the uh, uh, the ASA, ASM, the handing over these these um, prizes is an important part of the, for the society. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you all of the speakers again, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.